<laughs> okay. So hello, I'm Becky Klein. Um, my, this research paper was written for my AE501 class last semester. I also did a case study on this same museum uh, during my class. My thesis for the paper was that American museums should follow the example of the Joslin Art Museum in Omaha, Nebraska in removing barriers to arts participation by eliminating admission fees for people to get in. The research methods I used to do my research included reading journal articles and trade publications. Um, I read annual reports that the museum published and also studied their financial information. A little background on the museum. Uh, it was built in the 1930s by Sarah Joslin. She and her husband George were very successful in the newspaper industry in Omaha and the surrounding area in the early 20th century, and they were avid supporters of the arts and had quite an extensive personal collection. When he passed away, she built the museum and gave it to the city of Omaha, and the idea was that the arts would be accessible to everyone in the city as a place to enjoy music, fine art, and so forth. It's really a beautiful building, too. You can see this is the outside of the building. Their vision statement is to be cherished and respected as a premier art museum. And their mission statement is Joslin Art Museum collects, preserves, and interprets the visual arts of the highest quality, fostering appreciation and enjoyment of art for the benefit of a diverse audience. Um, they are privileged in that they enjoy no competition in the city of Omaha. It's the only art museum there. But they also have a very broad uh, base of support. People are not apathetic about the arts in Omaha. Um, some of their well-known pieces are Degas' Little Dancer, Jackson Pollock's Galaxy, and Dale Jones' Jimmy the Inside and Out, which was a more recent acquisition in the collection. They also are known for their collections of American West art, which tells the history of the founding of our country um, through art and sculpture and things like that they have. Um, quite an extensive collection. They're very, very well known for that. Um, when the museum opened, they charged no admission fees at all. But in 1965, they started charging admission. It was a quarter. And over time, they gradually increased that, that admission rate. Uh, the last time they set a higher admission rate, it was 2010. That was set at $8 for adults. Um, children and seniors were usually a dollar or two less than that. But they also had to pay an admission. So um, these admission fees actually were only about two to four percent of their total revenue over the course that, of time that they charged admission fees. That's pretty common among most museums, actually. Um, government spending, um, government funding is not a big source of revenue for most museums. The exception is the Smithsonian Institution, since that's for the national museum system. Um, but most, most museums, like the Joslin, depend on revenue from memberships, uh, corporate contributions, individual donations, uh, rental of their space, special events, and of course, gift shops and cafes in the museums. So this is common uh, among them and other museums. Uh, in the late 80s, 90s, early 90s, approximately half of museums all charged an admission fee. That has gradually declined. So by 2008, only about a third of museums charged admission fees. But the Jocelyn was still charging at this time. Um, you'll notice, though, probably many of you have been to museums and noticed when you're there that there is a period of time every week when there's free admission to get in. Um, a lot of people tend to enjoy that opportunity to go in for free. Some museums have very high admission fees, uh, such as the Chicago Institute of Art, some of the other really well-known galleries and museums. And it's very common that museums see the bulk of their visitors during those free admission fees. There were concerns and suggestions of eliminating the admission fees beginning in the 1970s. The University of Nebraska did some research in conjunction with the museum to set some strategic plans and priorities uh, looking forward into the future, and it, they started talking. That was only about 10, 15 years after they had instituted the admission team, so they, they felt those concerns actually pretty early on in the process. Um, and you can see the comment that they didn't want people to 
down for uh, the Joslin was heavily dependent on other sources of revenue. Uh, one of their major sources of revenue was Enron Corporation. Um, my dad actually worked for Enron for many years, um, and uh, they had the, through a series of mergers and acquisitions, they became Enron, but early on, when they were still intern North, they started this uh, art foundation and provided funds and collections to the Joslin, and as they became Enron, that continued. In the mid-80s, when they moved their headquarters down to Houston, they pulled all of that support away from the museum, all that funding, all of the collections. That was a huge obstacle that the, the museum had to overcome. Um, they were able to replace most of the, the revenue that they lost, and they were able to retain two of the collections. One collection Enron gave to them, another they purchased, but the third collection they lost to the Gene Autry Museum out in LA. Um, there were also some confusions about tax obligations and state law around that time. In the mid-90s, uh, after all of the dust had kind of started to settle, they issued a cultural bond, which they used for a massive expansion of the gallery. What they saw was that expansion led to a huge increase in people attending the museum. And that was even with the admission fees still in place. So they saw a huge jump of about 33%. So they worked on continuing to develop their educational and outreach programs. They issued a second bond in 2001 for some, uh, paying off the last of the debt, expanding the land that they own and acquiring more pieces for their collection. Um, but they were starting to notice that most of their visitors came in during those two free hours on Saturdays when there was no admission fee. So finally in 2013, the CEO, Jack Becker, said, all right, it's time to, to make this decision. So they eliminated the admission fee. And the Sherwood Foundation, which is run by Susan Buffett, daughter of the very famous Warren Buffett, they, the Buffett family lives in Omaha, they gave a grant to help defray the cost from that lost revenue. Um, so they have not seen a negative impact. But they have also continued to see that attendance at the museum continues to grow now that they don't charge an admission fee. More and more people are going, um, and their numbers have grown consistently every year. They still rent out the space and have special events, gift shop sales, um, the cafe, and so forth. They have annual galas, things like that. So um, they're, they're pretty secure right now. Uh, have not caused any kind of financial hardship for them. So my conclusion is that more museums should follow their example, especially if they're smaller museums like that, uh, that, that don't rely on tourist dollars. So it's not a one-size-fits-all solution. You know, the Chicago Institute of Art probably is doing pretty well continuing to charge admission fees because it helps control some of the foot traffic. You know, would the facility be able to handle the number of people if they eliminated those admission fees? Other museums kind of face the same thing. So, and museums that the admission charges funds more than that two to four percent of their annual revenue probably should not consider eliminating the admission fees either. Thank you. Questions? Yes. As fees were eliminated and foot traffic increased, did they, was there any mention of uh, uh, donations increasing as well? They placed a higher emphasis on fundraising, so they intentionally worked for more fundraising. So yes, they got more in donations, but some of that was intentional on their part. So they, they put a higher emphasis as well on memberships. So, And they still charge for certain special exhibits that come in, um, you know, maybe a collection that's on loan from another museum, they'll charge for some of those, but even those fees are not terribly high. Good question. Did your data come with any information about the age? I mean, it, it, I know arts organizations have an aging population typically. It, it, I, I don't know, is there anything about that? Does having free admission get younger people in? Um, I didn't look at that specifically, but they do have a lot of school outreach programs where they are intentionally trying to reach a younger audience and educate children. 
Um, they also have a special gallery that is designed for children, um, I would say primarily elementary and middle school age. It's very hands-on, uh, sort of a hybrid art and science gallery, but that appeals a lot to, to kids and, and they have a lot of visitors there as well. Um, correct me if I'm confusing museums, but was this the museum that also has that um, where they cultivate young donors? It's yes. like a young people's, but by young people's they mean people in their 20s, um, yes. early 30s. Yes, they have a, um, a separate organization that's a support organization specifically for young art, uh, I can't remember the name right now. Um, but it's people in their 20s to 40s um, who they maybe aren't ready to be a major donor yet, but they still have an interest in the arts, they have a membership, they are special donors, they have special events, things like that, so they're kind of cultivating their, their future ability to be a big player. So when all those millennials start, find that job of the life and <laughs> start making all the money they're going to give it to the museum. Yes. So what led you to look at the Johnson Museum as opposed to other museums? I'm from Omaha. <laughs> I love my hometown. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I've been to the Jocelyn, not recently enough, um, but I have a special affinity from, for Nebraska, anything to do with Nebraska, so that's why okay. I chose It's hard to find information, though. I, you know, people don't study museums and arts organizations in Omaha the same way they do coastal or other big city yeah. museums and things. So it was kind of hard to find some of the information that I needed and keep digging. How much of it was like public record information like that if they're a nonprofit like was were you able to get access to like their records and things like that versus like actually having to like, get a hold of the band to get stuff? That's a good question. Um, I was able to use GuideStar to get a hold of their 990 tax forms, and they had, I want to say, the last five years or so of that data. Um, anything older than that, I'm not sure. I didn't pay for a premium account, so I'm not sure what additional information was there. Um, their annual reports on their website, they have at least 10 years of that, and so I was able to go back at least that far. So, yeah, some 